Good afternoon and thank you for joining our live stream today. Today we have Bill Barker and Thomas Jefferson talking about spring and how spring affected everyone at Monticello. Let us know where you're joining from and please leave any questions for Mr. Jefferson in the comments. Citizens, what a pleasure. A pleasure particularly to welcome you all here to El Monticello in the spring. In the spring, just but a few weeks since it has begun for all of us with the vernal equinox here. And uh, well, quite frankly, I've been very infused in reading uh, as much as I can uh, with the dawn of greater light uh, for the next several months. Reading Shakespeare. Who else uh, speaks so much to the spring? Uh, to wit, his sonnet number 98. From you have I been absent in the spring when proud pied April dressed in all his trim hath put a spirit of youth in everything that heavy Saturn laughed and leaped with him. Yet not the lays of birds nor the sweet smell of different flowers in odor and in hue could make me any summer's story tell or from their proud lap pluck them where they grew. Nor did I wonder at the lilies white, nor praise the deep vermilion in the rose. They were but sweet, but figures of delight, drawn after you, you, pattern of all those, yet seemed it winter still, and you away, as with your shadow, I with these did play. Is that not spring for all of us after the, the winter tide and, and here finally to be able to enjoy the splendor, the beauty of spring and uh, all of the hues, if you will, all of the textures of the flowers and so much more. And here I am speaking before you have the opportunity to inquire of me what you bring here on your mind. So no further, this time is yours. I look forward to hearing your questions. Uh, and so if you will, Mel, I, uh, what have we from our folks? Well, tell us what you most look forward to about the approach of the spring season and then some of the challenges of preparing the house and farm for spring. Ah, yes, well, I think what I look forward to more than anything else is the fact that with the approach of winter, I always want to shudder with the idea of winter. In fact, I wrote Mr. Adams uh, that uh, I wish I could be like the dormouse. Uh, that is able to hibernate through the winter and wake along with him as spring returns. It is a time of the year that I anticipate and look forward to all of the beauty as I spoke earlier. It is a time when we have the opportunity to refresh and that means not only the soul but it means within our families to refresh within the house and of course out of doors as spring would allow. So I look forward to more or less dress the house in spring, whereas we had heavy curtains and had heavy bedclothes and uh, the great uh, carpets and rugs upon the floor that we can remove all of this and then drape our bedsteads with uh, linens, if you will, uh, and silks, uh, and nonetheless for, for our furniture, uh, for our settees and our chairs, uh, to drape them accordingly as we enjoy the spring. Uh, most particularly springtime, open the windows, open all of the windows, uh, open the doors, let the animation of the airs pervade the household. And out of doors, well, we prepare the soil. Uh, we have been doing so since the fall and with the dormancy of winter and the snows, here's a time when we can churn up that soil, if you will, begin to plant and to see much of the labor expended in the fall uh, begin to bloom and blossom there before us. Well, we already have some questions coming in from our viewers and April asks, what is your favorite spring memory? April, your name is April? Good Lord of mercy, there you are. What a pleasure indeed. Well, I think back to spring as a time of birth 
April, the births of many, many children occurring in the spring. Lamentably for me, they have uh, left me with a deep sense of remorse, and perhaps later I may rep reply to that more distinctly, but also the spring brings about a time when we may begin to travel. Now, not in the early spring, because so much may still be muddy, and, uh, and the roadways are somewhat impassable, and you can easily get stuck in the mud. And that is why when I went back and forth to Washington City, uh, I chose a time and when the ground would be the more solid that I could return from Washington City. I spent most of the winters there. Uh, and then, of course, I'd go back for a short time before I would come back for the, for the summer. Now, I cannot deny that perhaps one of the most historically uh, profound reminiscences is when I left Monticello uh, in April and this was to go to Philadelphia for the extension of the Second Continental Congress. I somewhat hesitate because at the end of March when I was about to leave, my dear mother, Mrs. Peter Jefferson, was overcome quite suddenly with an acute illness that took her away uh, within but one or two days. And as I've written, a migraine headache nearly took me away for two weeks as I suffered that before setting out uh, to Philadelphia City. And I think you know, arriving there then uh, in April, late April, but a week or two later, in the first week of June, uh, we heard the news uh, of the resolution for independency brought northwards to Philadelphia from Williamsburg, Virginia. That resolution passed in Williamsburg in the spring, May the 15th, 1776. So we have some viewers asking about the gardens, and um, I guess when we think of spring, we think of plants blooming and flowers blooming. And uh, Deborah wonders if you have left parts of your own properties to bloom with wildflowers. Oh, my heavens, Deborah, yes, of course, the wildflowers are planted by nature, nature's God. Uh, I certainly allow great fields to particularly be resuscitated in their cultivation, that we do not continually uh, uh, plow the lands one year after the next year after the next year, no, allow it to lay fallow uh, for a time. And uh, that is when you begin to see the wildflowers uh, begin to pop about. Uh, the irises, of course, that we see uh, about the era, they are indigenous and natural. Uh, I'm always very pleased in, in a meadow, or more particularly, may I say, in woodlands, where there is enough shade uh, that we allow for the cultivation of the periwinkle. Uh, now, the periwinkle is not indigenous. It has been brought over uh, from England to be used as a ground cover for graveyards and family cemeteries. So, Deborah, you might say that they are somewhat of a wild flower brought over from England and grow wildly through the woods uh, and some of the fields, and they hold a most sanctimonious uh, relevance to those who are long past. So can you talk a little bit about some of the other most interesting plants for you to watch coming to life at spring, Monticello? Well, the plant, the flower that we have put into the ground, hundreds if not thousands as I would enjoy, doing so in October and November through the first week of December, tulips. Tulips, probably one of my favorite flowers. Oh, and when you think of the contentions over the, the production of tulips, the, the commerce in tulips. There were actually tulip wars uh, that were fought. Uh, I think one of the greatest advantages we've had as we settled here in the east of North America was to import many, many tulips uh, that we then are able to see spring from the ground in the early spring. In fact, look at the tulips that you see right here. Are they not most beautiful flowers? And I'm happy to say we have hundreds and I, I encourage you to count because it'll make you stay here much the longer. We have thousands of tulips here for you to appreciate at El Monticello. So Ezra, who is age 12, asks about plants that you brought from foreign countries for the spring bloom. I know you just mentioned tulips. Are there, are there others you want to talk about? Yes, I have enjoyed bringing some roses that I was able to see in England uh, that were not so indigenous here. 
uh, in our land. And when you think also of some of the flowers that I've been able to receive here at Monticello, what about many that were sent to me uh, by Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant William Clark? Uh, I think one of the favorite flowers that they sent me uh, was snow on the mountain. Now that has not yet bloomed, but it will be coming up uh, towards the end of the spring and into the summer. And it is literally what it sounds like. It is, as it grows to a particular height, upwards uh, sometimes at about a foot and a half, two feet, it is a blanket, if you will, of, uh, of white, delicate flowers looking very much like snow on the mountain. And from what I learned from Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant Clark, as they approached the great stony mountains to the far west, I believe you refer to them as the Rockies now, there they saw them capped uh, with snow extensively. Uh, they said it was quite a sight to be able to espy that uh, from a distance far east there in the far western horizon. So it must have been striking. Now, of course, here on Monticello, uh, we have the majesty of the Blue Ridge Mountains to the west. And nonetheless, I may tell you, uh, the snow on the mountain that we plant in our gardens sent back from the far west does favor the snow on the mountains of our Blue Ridge in wintertime. Well, let's talk a little bit more about some of the other people living and working here at Monticello. What were some of the concerns and tasks faced by the enslaved people at Monticello during the spring? Oh, mercy indeed. The great concerns was whether uh, their vegetables that they had stored up from, uh, for the winter time, whether the pickled cucumbers uh, and the like of the vegetables they cultivate, the beans that they cultivate, the squash that they cultivate, will serve them through the winter. And, and the more so because, as you know, as spring begins, we are all out in the fields. Our families are there to begin to plant and to cultivate and produce. And so that leaves them little time for them to continue to cultivate their gardens and some of their uh, small fields that they have. Uh, if there is an overproduction for them, and that does not happen too often, then they are want to sell their produce. Uh, in fact, my grandchildren frequently have want to, to buy uh, beans, to buy cucumbers, uh, and, and the same produce of the enslaved families here at Monticello. So I will not deny that oftentimes they will plant at night uh, in the springtime because most of their days, as you know, are put to the cultivation of our fields and our crops and the gardens here. What are some of the dishes and meals that you look forward to having on your table in the spring? <laughs> Peas. I thoroughly enjoy peas. I, I make an effort to see they are planted uh, in early February, and oftentimes we're fortunate to, to see them sprout from the ground by the end of February, the first week in March, particularly the Albany pea or the Mayflower pea. Uh, in fact, they're sprouting right now here in our vegetable garden. And perhaps we've talked about in the past the fa fact that there are contests amongst the farmers here in the vicinity of Charlottesville as to who may cultivate the first batch of peas in the early spring. Mr. Divers and I, Mr. Divers of Farmington and I have engaged a contest for several years uh, to the extent whoever cultivates the first batch of peas then welcomes the entire neighborhood uh, to dinner in the in mid-afternoon. Uh, in fact, this year, I will tell you, my, my daughter, Mrs. Randall, uh, was delighted when I announced to her that uh, the first batch of peas ha had come up. I believe it was the Albany pea. And she said, oh, Father, you must announce this immediately through the neighborhood. Well, I failed to do so uh, for several days uh, when uh, Mrs. Randolph uh, made it known to me that Mr. Divers had just announced throughout the neighborhood that he had cultivated the first batch of peas. Now, it might not have been the Albany, it might have been the Mayflower pea. But in any respect, my daughter felt uh, quite sorry that we had not announced it, and then I said, dear, dear, have no worry, we will have a free meal at Farmington, which we did. What extensive hospitality we enjoyed there. So we have a couple of viewers asking about Easter at Monticello. Can you tell us how you might have celebrated Easter at Monticello? With, a, with an extensive dinner, particularly provided for all of those who have come to visit uh, during that, uh, that, well, that time of uh, great um, reflection, if you will, in, in the sense of rebirth uh, accordingly. Uh, I always try to attend the services 
the services held by the Episcopalians who will rent out uh, the courthouse down here in Charlottesville. Now many other sects uh, also rent out the courthouse, uh, so the Episcopalians have their time to do so. And uh, if that falls uh, during Easter, well then I will attend to, to services there. Not many people realize this, but I, I remain on the vestry uh, as I was uh, first appointed to the vestry of St. Anne's Parish in Elbermorrow County, where my father was vestryman accordingly. So yes, Easter is a time uh, when our family gathers closely together and welcomes so many others coming to visit uh, to enjoy our Easter meal. So how about just daily schedules during spring? How do daily schedules and household arrangements change with the seasons? Well, I would suggest the daily schedules as different uh, in the spring than they have been through the winter uh, are far more active. The, the schedule is uh, pretty much the same as far as all of the tasks and the chores and efforts to be attended to uh, from morning until evening. But I think it's a bit more active because we have more visitors uh, coming to visit. And as I mentioned earlier, the opening up of windows, the opening of the doors, uh, rolling up the carpets and the, the heavy curtains that we have uh, requires a bit more activity. But it is, uh, if you will, the activities of the house as usual. We try to maintain it consistently through the year. Now, as I spoke about the planting and uh, our gardens uh, and our, our crops, well, Wormley Hughes, as you know, I have great faith in probably the foremost of gardeners in all of Virginia. And so he is quite active uh, uh, more than throughout the rest of the year in attending to plantings uh, in our vegetable garden. So Len asks what plant you have struggled to grow. <laughs> Len, when I start thinking about the plants I have struggled to grow, it is almost an endless grow, it's almost an endless list. Uh, so much of the seeds that have been sent to me from uh, gentlemen and ladies across the globe uh, have failed in my attention to cultivate them. And Len, here's another thing too. In the fall, we are want to gather seeds uh, from the plants that have thrived uh, already through the year that we can count on as, as thriving. But then that does not mean in the spring that the majority of those seeds are still viable to plant and spring forth anew uh, here with the new spring season. So there are many failures then. Even some of the tulips and the bulbs may fail. Uh, some of the uh, Virginia bluebells that we so enjoy every year where you have a lush uh, patch of bluebells at one point may fail the next year. So I can, and some of the plants that were sent back by um, uh, Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant Clark have failed accordingly. So I, I'm sorry that I can't announce one particular plant a flower that has consistently failed uh, over any other. It, it's like trying to cultivate foreign wine. Hmm. Uh, you can consider that a cultivation. You consider that certainly a plant, a cultivating of grapes, but the foreign vines just don't seem to succeed. And I'm referring to Pinot Noir, and I'm referring to Cabernet and Sauvignon, Sangiovese, um, Nebbiolo, Barolo. No. So these are, are constant failures. Uh, that I cannot understand. And that, that does not mean that our native vines uh, do not prosper. Yes, they do. The, the muscadine grapes flourish. The, here in Virginia, North Carolina, the scuppernong uh, continue to flourish. So all I can tell you then is what I continue to strive and achieve, and that is plant an overabundance uh, of and both native plants, imported plants, seeds from previous years, the seeds that are sent to me in the commerce of seeds across the globe, and to plant an overabundance means you recognize you will have a failure. Expect that failure, but you will have successes. And so that is what I look forward to more than to account for any failure. Carol would like to know how your wardrobe changes in oh. the spring. Well, Carol, I can tell you I'm more than happy to uh, give up some of the heavy uh, woolen waistcoats and the heavy woolen frocks that I wear during the year. Now, I will tell you, Carol, I, as I get older, for whatever reason, I seem to just feel the cold more through predominantly the year than I've ever known it before. 
Um, and that's why I, uh, oftentimes I will continue to wear uh, a scarlet flannel waistcoat, even with the sleeves. But on this particular day, Carol, I can tell you right now, you have but to visit Al Monticello and you will see it's nearly a day in the summertime. Uh, as I take the temperature several times a day, uh, on this day I've already realized at noon that it is up about 75 degrees. Uh, so quite naturally I'm not going to wear my, my uh, <laughs> scarlet uh, waistcoat, flannel waistcoat, uh, but here to prefer a linen. Uh, and if you will, a silk waistcoat, which is far more comfortable uh, during the, the latter spring and particularly through the summertime and the early fall here in Virginia. In fact, Carol, as I have written according to one's clothing and how one feels the most comfortable, and is that not the object uh, for whatever clothing you choose to adorn yourself, uh, is the comfort and the ease uh, of your dress. In Virginia, Carol, I have written the sun is nearly vertical the entire year. So therefore, even when it's a bit cool, you can always count on the warmth of the sun if you know where to place yourself. So let's talk a little bit more about the enslaved people tending their own gardens to feed their families. You mentioned that they might grow vegetables they would then sell back to the Jefferson household, but can you uh, talk a little bit about the plants they might be growing to feed themselves? Yes, well, as I mentioned, beans and squash for the most part, uh, and of course cucumbers, which they favor to, well, to pickle uh, throughout the rest of the year. Uh, and also to salt a great deal of their vegetables too, allows it to last much the longer. So these are the predominant uh, vegetables that they will cook unto themselves. And mind you, they do not only uh, sell these to my own family, to my grandchildren. Uh, they want to sell to visitors that come to visit here as well. In fact, we encourage our visitors uh, uh, to attend to some of these families and see what they may be selling. Uh, as they have come to visit and take it with them as they proceed on their journeys. So George asks how all the plants on the mountaintop were watered. Well, George, this is our continued concern here on the mountaintop. Now, firstly, we are blessed uh, to have the Rivanna River, but a short distance uh, to the east and to the southeast a bit. I was, I was born and grew up along the, north, uh, the east bank of the Rivanna. And uh, so therefore, we do have that river as a source of water. Uh, there are also several springs here about uh, the mountaintop. We have the South Spring, we have the North Spring, and they continue to provide abundant water. But we had many other springs, some of which dried up, it appeared, uh, soon after the top of the mountain was leveled off in 1768. So I found it a necessity when we have uh, continued to, to build the house and improve upon it and renovate it, uh, to build cisterns, and, and so we do. We have uh, four particular cisterns here on both sides of the terraced walkway in the corners. Uh, and that provides uh, rainwater. The rainwater is collected as it falls upon the terrace, the terrace floor somewhat uh, uh, in an incline. The rainwater runs off into troughs. The troughs then empty the water into the cisterns in the corner of the, of the terraced walkway. So that is one way why how we provide ourselves with an abundance of water. So I know you talked about the peas, but Michelle asked what other kind of vegetables might be available right now in early spring. Parsley. We have parsley available, I'm happy to say. Uh, we have some lettuce available. We have uh, sorrel available uh, right now that has uh, come up. And, uh, and this, I will tell you, is, um, is quite the novelty uh, at the meal table. Uh, because uh, ever since I've returned from France, I provided the meal table a salad course. Have you heard of it? A salad course, or as I refer to it, stuffs of the garden. I, I became quite delighted with this as a habit and custom at the tables in France. And so when I returned as well, particularly beginning this time of year, I provide stuffs of the garden in particular course uh, at the meal table uh, for dinner. So we will have the sorrel, we will have the lettuce, we will have the parsley, and, uh, and peas, as I mentioned before. And I will tell you another thing. My granddaughter, Mrs. Bankhead, and uh, Carrie Randa Bankhead, uh, they live but a short distance here at Carlton House, uh, here on the uh, northwest side of, of the mountain. And, uh, well, 
Mrs. Bankhead has been keeping a, a recipe book, and I'm delighted to say that this is the book that the late Mrs. Jefferson, my late wife, utilized for entering her own recipes, even entering her own accounts. Uh, it is the same book that I have utilized for entering some of my law cases. So you can see this particular book uh, represents quite the intimacy within our family from one generation to the next. And so Anne Carey Randolph Bankhead has entered some of her recipes and one of the most favorite recipes she has is a recipe of peas that is covered with, um, if you will, a more or less a sugared uh, uh, egg uh, in, the, in the peas recipe. I can't explain it a bit more except to say it is one of the most savory recipes placed at the table in my, my granddaughter's family cookbook. Lynn asks how you deal with pests or insects. Well, I can tell you we try to do as best we can with uh, certain tar buckets uh, that can attract some of the flies and uh, then diminish the great number that fly through the house. Uh, so we have the tar buckets in and about the house and of course the swatter uh, is always necessary, uh, particularly at the time when the flies are abundant or the mosquitoes. Uh, we may be 900 feet above sea level but that does not preempt a great number of mosquitoes to continue to, uh, to bother us. So that is about as, as best as you can do. Now here's an interesting thing as well. Do I do, though I do not partake of it, uh, and though I have been subject for many, many years, particularly through inheritance, uh, to cultivate extensively that weed of infinite wretchedness, I think you know what I'm referring to, tobacco, uh, do you know that amongst its early utilities as it was introduced to the European by the natives of this land, uh, next to um, more or less purging the system of ill health. Oh yes, indeed, tobacco can do that when taken sparingly. But also one of its early uses was to ward off mosquitoes, ward off mosquitoes. So we do find that many uh, want to utilize that at a time of the year when the great vermin of nature may pervade the airs as we're trying to be comfortable in our, our conversation. Well, let's leave on some advice for us all. What advice do you have as we enter into this springtime season? Enjoy the spring. That is my advice. Enjoy the spring and carry with you the memories of those you continue to hold dear in the depths of your heart. That their memory is the further refreshed with the rejuvenation of the life that spring so represents. Go out in amongst the airs. Take long walks as I enjoy to do myself. I am never a day out of the saddle. Spring is one of my favorite times of the year to be in the saddle and to ride through my native uh, woods and my native fields and, and to ponder as I am well into my autumn years uh, that I hope all my days will end where I show you my wishes do. Right here at Monticello, not another place upon the globe can take the place of my native woods and fields. That as we begin to travel, the more so through the spring, that you will feel welcome to come visit us here so that with more people we can enjoy the springtime for more extensive confabulation upon many subjects. And perhaps you will bring here seeds or flowers that, your fa that you favor, that we can trade back and forth and to simply enjoy the beauty of the garden. And here I may share with you Though I was never fortunate to, to meet him, uh, the great Voltaire, the great Voltaire, Dr. Franklin knew him, he had that opportunity, but as I had arrived in Paris the late summer of 1784, Voltaire had been passed, uh, oh, some years, about a, a good six or seven years, and yet his work, Candide, Candide, what a brilliant, brilliant regard for the benevolence and the humanity that may be found in the nature of man. That though man is prone to, to seek out and to search out what may improve his life, and particularly how he might improve the life of others, that nothing, nothing in the entire universe can be more satisfactory unto an individual than the cultivation of the garden. 
therein may be found great truth, therein may be found great patience to abide by the rhythms of the universe, all of that put into its effect by the great architect in the universe. In fact, as I continue to pursue the cultivation of the garden, I can assure you as I grow ever the older, I but remain a young God. Well, come here to appreciate our gardens here at Monticello, meet with all of our families, uh, and rest assured that uh, as you stay for dinner, perhaps afterwards, uh, we will enjoy a read amongst all of us, maybe some further Shakespeare. Uh, this one delightful uh, song, which he has in Love Labor's Lost, uh, to wit, when daisies pied and violets blue and ladies smocks all silver white and cuckoo buds of yellow hue do paint the meadows with delight. The cuckoo then on every tree mocks married men for thus, well here, I shall find a, uh, another, another uh, sonnet here to our great delight.